Good, thank you. Um, yeah, awesome. That looks good. Okay, well, let's get started then. Um, yeah, thanks very much for everybody that's looked on to the practical part of the course. Um, still not sure um, when the dates are for there. It looks like we're getting closer to getting out of lockdown, so hopefully it won't be too much longer. I look to complete that um, certainly by the end of October. So I guess if we look at level three being two weeks, then 6th of October, we should be able to start sailing again, which should give us plenty of time to get the practical part done for everybody who wants to do it. Um, and, you know, we should then, um, you yeah, know, almost have a, a proper um, correct uh, schedule. Um, so I'm just going through and turning off a few cameras and stuff. Uh, yeah, looks like everyone's been real good. All right. Cool. Um, yeah, so just a question from uh, Hester. Will, will we do any practicals during the week or, or at the weekends only? So because we've got, you know, 100 or so people booked on to this, I think if we're just doing it at the weekends, it's going to take us ages to do it. So, yeah, I think I probably will throw in a few evening options. Um, that will probably be three evenings, though, to get the same amount of time out on the water. Um, but, yeah, so I'm, now we know that we're going into level two or we're heading that way anyway. Um, I'll look to sort that schedule out. I need to, well, I'll be going into work tomorrow to we'll do some work on some boats and get ready for level two. Um, but until I find out the racing schedule and everything else that's going on at the Yacht Club, I won't be able to confirm the our sailing schedule. But um, yeah, so you, you'll definitely get a choice over which day or evening. Um, so I just make a, you know, some days and some evenings available and then you can tell me which ones that you want to do or that you're available for. And we'll try and, um, you know, make sure everyone gets through there. I see that um, you know, Graham's interested in possibly taking the day off work. You've already had a few days off work, haven't you, Graham? But, yeah, there might be some options to run some during the week and um, actually, you know, from nine until, um, you know, six o'clock or something. Um, but, yeah, so probably all, all options are there. And if I can utilise as many of those options as possible, that would give us um, a chance to get through, well, our current backlog, because we had classes over the winter that were postponed and haven't finished because of the lockdown. And we've got courses that would have started during the lockdown, but obviously we haven't been able to start them. So we've got quite a backlog to get through. So um, having as many sailing options as possible would be great to get through that. Um, yeah, okay. And let's, um, yeah, let's get back to the um, PowerPoint. Um, I'll just stop this one. Um, and Lesson three. So well done for making it this far. Um, yeah, this some of this stuff is quite weighty. Um, might be a good idea to have a look at this video you know, a couple of times to make sure you get your head around it. And also some of the stuff that we do in this lesson, of course, normally people would have already had some sailing experience with us. So, you know, they've already been out on the boat, they've done the, the practicals for lesson one and lesson two. So, you know, they would already have a bit of a head start on some of this stuff. But anyway, lockdown has given us this opportunity. So let's make the most of it. So what are we going to look at today? Well, we'll have a, I've been talking in lesson one and lesson two about seeing the wind. And obviously we can't see the air, but we can see the effect that the air moving has on the water and on other things. So we'll have a look at, look at that. We'll have a bit of a recap quiz on some of the stuff we did on lesson one and lesson two. 
We'll have a look at something called telltales. And that will help us understand how the air is flowing over the sail. Make sure we're getting some lift. Bit more detail on sail shape. We'll have a look at reefing as well, which is basically making the sail smaller for those days where it's quite windy. And the all important man overboard. Now that's a wee bit sexist. Um, I'm sure every sailor would go and pick up a lady as well, but man overboard is what it's called. Um, person overboard is would be more PC, but it's something quite different. So if we're doing a trip report for the Coast Guard, they will ask us how many POB do we have? And that's simply persons on board rather than persons overboard. So POB, well, that would be a better set of initials to use or an acronym, but it, yeah, it's already taken, unfortunately. And then we'll go over the on water stuff that we would be doing if we were going sailing. And like say, my, my intention for that on water stuff would be to uh, do the lesson one and lesson two in the morning, come in for lunch and then do all of the lesson three stuff in the afternoon. If we were doing that in the evenings, um, then we could do the lesson one stuff one evening and then the lesson two stuff and then the lesson three stuff on. So it'd be three evenings if we split the course in the evenings. But if it was going to be one day, whether it was going to be a day during the week or a day over the weekend, then we would um, yeah, use that. Um, we, we, yeah, we would we would do the lesson one and two in the morning. OK, let's um, have a look at um, how we can see the wind. So here we've got some very socially responsible um, uh, seagulls and they are being very good in keeping the safe distance from each other. I'll throw up a question there, which way do you think the wind's going? So anybody want to stick that on the chat? What do you think? Hard to tell from a static picture, isn't it? From right to left, Graham says, yeah. So the wind is straight on the, the um, seagull's face. So the seagulls always, um, when they're not flying anyway, stand so they're facing into wind and that helps them take off, increases their airspeed without even moving. So noticing small things in nature can give us an idea of where the wind's coming from. So we'll look at this next one. I've got a, oh, there's, there's the wind coming through there, straight in their faces. And we've got some flags now, they're not very good photographs, but in fact, they look terrible from when I last saw them. They look better than that when I was preparing the slide. Anyway, there we've got the, some flags on the Harbour Bridge and they can give us a hand to figure out where the wind's coming from as well. So when I'm coming out of the marina, I always have a glance over at the Harbour Bridge to see what the flags are doing. And we can learn quite a lot by noticing the flags. So we've got the wind direction there. So the flagpole is windward and the flag itself is being blown downwind. So that's the leeward, leeward side. So there's our wind angle. But we can also have a bit of a guess at this wind speed. So if the flag's a bit droopy and not really flying, then it's probably five knots or less. If the flags are flying really well, then we've probably got more than five knots. In fact, that picture on the right, we're probably looking at eight to 10 knots of wind by the way they're flying. So they're quite big flags on the Harbour Bridge and they do need a wee bit of wind to get them to fly like that. So when we notice these things, not so much when we're looking at seagulls, but certainly flags, we can tell the wind direction and have a bit of an idea of wind speed as well. So here's a nice wave and waves always go downwind. So the air moving pushes on the surface and it pushes up these waves. So the wave is traveling downwind. And I did the best I could to line that arrow up with what I thought the wind direction would be. 
And yeah, so the wind's making that wave and the surfer is enjoying it. And it's traveling downwind. And I'd think that that was a onshore breeze onto the beach. So yeah, in light wind, there might not be many waves at all, uh, but in stronger breeze, there will be more waves and they will be bigger. Here we've got a nice picture, nice photo from Cowell. And this is the view from Lidgard House. So I know I've spoken to a few of you that are interested in that level two course we run. So this is the view that you wake up to in the morning. On this area of the photograph on the bottom left, you can see the water is quite shiny. And that means there's not very much wind there. So here with the shiny water, there's probably not enough wind to sail. But if we look a bit further out into Bonacord Harbour, the water's a bit darker. So in the middle here, the water's dark and it's dark because it's less reflective because there's more waves. And the more waves there are, the darker the water will be and the more wind there is. So even from your bedroom at Lidgard House, when you get up in the morning on that level two course, you've got to look out the window and have a good idea of how much wind there is in that bay. In here, this is um, uh, Smelting House Bay, and there's, there's never very much wind in there, but out in the middle of Bonacord Harbour, there's, there's usually some. So if we were talking about anchoring, this boat here has probably been in a bit more wind and a bit more waves overnight than the boats that were anchored in Bonacore, in uh, Smelting House Bay. So being able to tuck into a bay and get out of the wind will give you a much nicer night's sleep. But when we're sailing, given that all of our power comes from the wind, we want to be noticing these dark patches. And if we want to sail fast, we want to be sailing in these dark patches. If we're not too worried about how far we're, how fast we're sailing, in fact, we might be wanting an easier time. Well, maybe we could sail in where the water is lighter, a lighter colour, more shiny, and that will be less wind for us. Yeah, okay. So let's have a look at this recap quiz. So yeah, I think some of these questions might be a little bit hard because you haven't had the experience of sailing yet. So I will just have a little look at the, the chat now because I, I see that has been a... Um, oh yeah, no chat that I've missed. Okay, so what are the three main points of sale? And this time we're asking what, what's the feeling associated with it? So I know you haven't been out on the boat, so you probably haven't experienced that yet, but we, we'll talk about the feelings anyway. You also have a look at the, the forecast um, or where to get the, today's forecast from, uh, how the sail works, and the bit about the telltales will, um, uh, yeah, see so from Melanie, so we're already getting into an answer. Yeah, let's bring that answer up then. So we've got close hauled. There's a definite feeling of power on the boat. The boat might be healing a little bit. We might feel that the rudder has got some loading on it. We might be able to, it might feel a bit heavy. Um, it's cold and wet. Yeah, we're going straight into the waves. So there might be a bit of water coming over the deck and we're, we're straight, in, straight into the waves. So it's cold because the wind is blowing in our faces. On a beam reach, um, we've got a lot more speed, uh, more power, still healing, but the waves will be hitting the side of the boat, not the bow. On a breach, broad reach, particularly if we've got a um, downwind sail, like a spinnaker or a jenica, then we'll be going faster even still. And we might even be able to get the boat surfing on the waves. Getting a big boat surfing is an amazing feeling. And running sometimes feels that someone's turned the, turned the wind off. And that's because you know, we're going in the same direction of, as the wind. So we have 
less wind going past us, if you like, because so if we're doing five knots downwind and the wind is doing 10 knots, say, we're going to feel five knots of wind. That's the difference. But if we're going upwind and we're doing five knots and we feel, and the wind is 10 knots, well, we're going to feel 15 knots of wind. So it does definitely feel less wind when you go downwind. Um, with the forecast, yep, we went through that quite well, I think, last uh, Thursday. So we want to have a look at some of these apps, Windy Predict Wind, Wind Guru, the website, Met Service. I find the Met Service app and website a bit clunky, but I really like the Coast Guard app. And that will, the Coast Guard app will tell us what the wind is actually doing right now. And Windy and Predict Wind, Wind Guru, they're the ones that are doing the forecast. Okay. So how does a sail work? Well, like an aeroplane wing, we need to create that lift. We're not necessarily being blown along. We are if we go straight downwind, but on all other points of sail, we're creating lift and it's working more like an aeroplane wing. We don't need to get too worried about the physics of that. You know, it, um, how an aeroplane works, you know, it's not a requirement that you know that, but as long as you understand the airplane does take off at the end of the runway and what makes it go up is the same thing that makes us go forward when we're sailing upwind. And I'm going to skip past this telltale thing because um, we've actually got a section in lesson three that we're going to um, go over and that will give you a bit more understanding of why that is. Okay, so let's have a look at the telltales. So that's what the telltales look like. These green and red bits of wool. So on the starboard side of the sail, we'll have green bits of wool. And on the port side of the sail, we'll have red bits. And yeah, Woolies is the kind of slang name. Uh, Telltales, I believe, is the proper name. And there are some on the back edge of the sail. They're called Leech Telltales. And they will help us tell whether the wind is flowing over the sail correctly. So if they're flying in a straight line, sort of horizontally, then the wind's flowing that way. If they're doing a helicopter impression and spinning around, well, there's a lot of the turbulence on that side of the sail and we won't be creating lift if that's the case. Yeah. So <clears throat> on, on our boat, so this is an Elliott 7, We've got the leech telltales on the main sail here, and we've got the other telltales in various places on the sail to tell us how the wind is flowing over each part of the sail. And this big red boat, that's a TP52, that's a professional race series that goes all over the world. And they have telltales on their main sail and on their jib as well. In fact, so does Team New Zealand. So the best way to know how the air is flowing over the sail is to put a little bit of grandma's knitting on the sail and use that just like a flag, if you like. So there's some mini flags all stuck on the sail. So getting back to that last question. So there's these next few slides answer that. So here we've got a green telltale that's not flying very well. We've got good airflow over the outside of the sail, but on the inside of the sail, the wind isn't flowing very well. Now, if we don't do anything, eventually the whole sail is going to start flapping and that's obviously not very good. So we need to adjust the sail and try and get it, get the sail in a position where both telltales, the one on the inside of the sail and the one on the outside is flying in a nice horizontal straight line. And we can do one of two things to do that for that inside telltale. So we can trim the sails on. Let's have a look at that. So if I pull the sail closer towards us, so we pull the back edge of the sail to the right, then there's gonna be more air go on the inside of the sail and that will make that telltale look like that. Or we can move the whole boat. So 
with the rudder, I can turn away from the wind and get a bit more wind on this side of the sail. So how the sail splits the wind, and we have some around the outside and some on the inside, we can change that either by steering or by using the rope that controls that sail. We'll have a look at the, what happens if the outside telltale is flapping now. And if we don't do anything, they'll just hang down. And that's quite a common sight to see telltales just dangling like that. And this picture in the top right hand corner is showing you what's happening. So the wind is coming along and it's just hitting the sail. It's not flowing around it. And that's because the sail is in very much the wrong position. So instead of that sail there, it needs to be more like this one. The wind is in the same direction, but if we position the sail like the bottom right hand picture, then the air will fly, flow over it and will create lift. So if the outside one is flapping around, we can ease the sail out so we can make the rope a bit longer, let the sail move out, a bit more air on that side of the sail, or we can turn the boat into wind a little bit. So that's like taking the front of the sail to the right, if you like. So we can move the whole boat into the wind or ease the sail out. Does the same thing, just positions that sail so that we've got both sets of telltales flying as this picture is. So there's quite a lot of, um, I guess, technical things with the sails. They're not just bird sheets that are up there. The shape is important and how the air flowing over them is important as well. Um, but we also have these bits of wool, very simple technology, very little to go wrong and they work really well. That's the best way of seeing the wind going over the sails. So if they're flying in a straight line like they are on the bottom right hand picture, then we'll be creating lift and the boat will be going fast. If one of those telltales is not flying straight, then we won't be going as fast as we could. Okay, here's a picture of Team New Zealand. And we can see on their main sail, they've got lots of telltales. We've got a leech telltale up here. And they've got telltales on their head sail as well. So even with an almost unlimited budget, um, you know, there's no fancy computer system that can help us see the wind flying over the sails or flowing over the sails, as well as a bit of grandma's knitting stuck on there. I see, did see a question come in, so I'll just have a look at that. Okay, good question from Craig. How, how do you decide if you want to let the sail out or use the tiller? Um, that depends on where I want to go, really. If I'm sailing, I would normally pull the sails in tight, as close as I can get them, and then use the tiller to make sure the um, telltales are flying over the sails really well. If I'm on a reach, though, it's probably because I'm heading directly in the directly to where I want to go. So like that, I wouldn't want to be changing course. I would be adjusting the sail. So it depends whether you've sheeted the sails all the way in and you just want to go upwind as close to that no-go zone as you can. And those telltales will let you know when, when you're in the no-go zone. So you can follow them. We don't have the line to follow on the water but we do have those telltales. If the sails are in, so they're close hauled, they're in as tight as you can get them, then we can just follow those telltales and that's the fastest way upwind. Um, if we're going on a reach though, it's probably because the next, you know, if we're going from point A to point B and that is a big reach, say, but we don't want to, be ordering our course we want to go in a straight line because that's the shortest distance so we'll be adjusting the sails then but yeah good question okay so sail shape 
so I think in the last lesson I said that, well, they're always going to be a triangle. We're not going to pull on the rope and suddenly they're a square. We are talking about the curvature that the sails have got. And these blue lines on our sails help us see the curvature. That's what they're for. It's not just a pretty decoration. So we can see that that it's got quite a curve to it, that sail on boat three, that head sail. And so that's what those stripes are for. So let's have a look at the um, sort of controls that can help us uh, adjust how much curve we've got in our sail. First, we need to go over some boat vocabulary again. So that hole at the front of the sail is called a tack. The one at the back is called a clue. And then we've got the head at the top. Yeah. And then we've got the back edge of the sail, which is called a leech, which is why the telltale on the back edge of the sail is called a leech telltale. And then the front edge of the sail is called the, um, oh, we've got the bottom, which is just like us, we've got a foot at the bottom and a head at the top. We don't have a luff though, which is the front edge of the sail. So you might hear someone, you know, if you've been crewing on someone's boat, you might hear them saying that, I don't know, the sails are luffing or we're luffing. So if the sails are flapping, then we say we're luffing, or you might say you're going to luff up, which would be to turn up into wind and make the sails flap. And the luff is that front edge of the sail, and that will start flapping first. Yeah. Okay. So we've got some other bits on, on the boat then, some controls that we've got. So we've got a backstay at Cunningham, a boom van or kicker. Then there's the jib car. We've got an outhaul and a traveler. And we're gonna go through all of those now. I know there's some funny words in there. And I'll try and explain where they've come from as we go. Yeah. Um, So I was just looking through everyone's cameras and stuff. Yeah, all good. All right. So here we are with the outhaul. And you can see that the outhaul is this orange rope that's just connected to the clue. And when we pull on that, the clue moves to the end of the boom. Pretty simple. We've got some photographs here. So this is one of the MRX boats that we're going to be doing the um, practical sailing on. Um, this is the boom. This grey rope here is the outhaul. And this is the clue of the sail. And at the moment that's been eased. So it's longer, if you like. And we can see on these pictures that there's quite, quite a lot of depth to the sail. It's quite quite a big gap between the boom and the sail material. On this picture on the right hand side we can see that nice aeroplane wing shape and it's still quite deep. So the deeper the sail the more power the sail is going to have. It's kind of like first gear on your car if you like. Here we'll look see what happens. Let's kind of pay attention to this so this is eased out as far as it would go. Well, well certainly you wouldn't want to sail with it eased out anymore. Um, so that's, you yeah, know, have a look at that distance. If we go on to the next slide, we can see that that distance there is greatly reduced. So we pulled the clue closer to the end of the boom. Let's stretch the sail. And now the sail looks much flatter. So we've reduced the depth of the sail. The sail has less power in it now, which is quite useful. It, it means that we can sail in a much wider um, range of, of, of wind. You know, we can sail in some light wind. We can sail in heavier conditions. Um, and, you know, we can decide how powerful the boat's going to be by using that outhaul. And the outhaul is probably one of the controls that has the most effect on the uh, 
on how powerful the, the boat is. Um, the Cunningham. So this comes from the America's Cup. So in the 1950s, Mr. Cunningham, American guy, was, was sailing in the America's Cup and he wanted to have the biggest sail possible. Now, with the boats at that time, the sails didn't go all the way up to the top of the mast. And if they wanted to tighten the luff, that front edge of the sail, they'd pull on the halyard. So the halyard's the rope that pulls the sail up the mast. And if your sail doesn't go to the top of the mast, you can put a bit more tension on it and pull the sail up the mast a bit more. So Mr Cunningham thought that was a bit of a silly idea. He wanted to make a sail that was really big. So he made his sail go to the top of the mast. And I think the rules at that point in the America's Cup was that they had a, a fixed height for the mast. So he made the sails go to the top of the mast and then he didn't have any control over that front edge of the sail. So he invented this thing and that's why it's called a cunningham. So there's another hole in the sail and a rope that just pulls the sail down. And this picture in the middle shows the Cunningham there, that's the hole. And this um, blue rope in here, that's, that's the Cunningham controls. We have another slide seeing how that works. So there we go. There's Mr Cunningham there. And we've got a white rope at the back of the sail. And when this is loose at the moment, and we can see there's a few wrinkles in that luff and that's for light wind so we'll have a, a fuller sail more powerful sail um if we pull on that rope though all of the slack if you like ends up at the bottom so we've got a bit of a kink in the sail here which is not great but it means that the bit above that is the shape that we want so in heavy conditions we we'll pull on the cunningham and flatten that front edge of the sail out so we've got the now we've got the out hole pulling on the foot of the sail flattening that and then we've got the cunningham flattening that front edge of the sail and the other controls just work on different areas but they're basically doing the same thing so here we've got the boom vang or kicker so kicker is the kind of slang name for it so here we've got the boom and we've got the boom bang in here and if we pull on the rope these pulleys get closer together which means that boom is going to come down which will put tension on that other edge of the sail, the back edge, the leech. On the picture of the MRX you see this metal pole here and that's not a boom bang, that's just, just a spring that holds the boom up. Um, this rope and the pulleys underneath that metal pole that's the actual boom vang and it comes along from this blue rope down here on the side of the keyboard here so let's have a look at that so this would is sort of more consistent with some of the smaller boats like the uh, elliott sevens that we use um but it's it's quite a good uh, slide i think so if we pull quite hard on the boom vang yeah, we pull the boom into the mast a bit. Um, the boom will come down and the mast will bend, which doesn't sound a great idea, but it's designed to do that. And you'll see that the lower part of the boom, sorry, the mast goes forward as the top of the mast comes back. So we're stretching this part of the sail and the leech is where it always was but the front edge of the sail has gone forward because it's on, on, the, on the mast. So that's kind of like having an outhaul a bit further up on the sail. So we're flattening the sail in that midsection. We're also flattening that back edge. Yep. And it all flattens the sail. So light winds, we probably have less boom bang so we wouldn't pull on the rope so hard in heavy conditions we'll pull on that really hard to flatten the sail now we have a look at the backstay so on larger boats they have a backstay as well which is 
to bend the mast with. So this sort of grey wire where this white arrow goes, goes onto the top of the mast and that's the backstay. And on the MRXs, um, we use that to bend the mast. So here we've got two MRX backs. One's got the backstay eased and the mast stands up pretty straight. And when we pull on the backstay of the one the other side of it, you can see how much it bends. And it bends here because that's where the forestay goes up to. So this would be called a, what a, I don't know, seven eighths fractional rig, if you want to get really technical. So the forestay can go to the top of the mast and we call that mast head. Or we could have the forestay attached into the mast, not quite at the top, but a little bit further down. And that's called a fractional. And that allows the backstay to pull the top of the mast back and cause that boom, that, that mast to bend. And the MRX in particular has a very um, tunable mast. You know, we can pull on that quite hard. But just like the other controls, the more we pull on it, the less power we're going to have. And that's what we're going to do in the heavy wind conditions. So if it's a light wind day, say it's less than 10 knots, we wouldn't have any backstay on at all. As the wind picks up, and certainly by the time we got to 20 knots, we'd be have lots of backstay on. And we'd be bending that mast and flattening the sail. Yep. Okay, so let's have a look at the Traveller. So this is the back, back of a um, Elliott 7. This here is called the main sheet, and that's simply the rope that we pull on to adjust where the boom is. So if we, so it comes along here, and there's the loop there. So you would actually operate it from this pulley sitting on the side of the boat. So if we pull on that, the boom comes closer to us. If we let the rope out, the boom goes out. So that's how we adjust the sail. But you can see here at the back of the boom, this pulley is also adjustable. So and the reason for that is that if we pull on the main sheet, that pulley here will come down and get closer to this one. So yes, the boom cuts closer to us, but it also comes down as well. So on this boat, we can use how much tension we've got in the main sheet for our sail shape, and then use the traveler, this device down here, to actually pos position the boom where we want it to be. So if we move this pulley down, so it's down at the left hand edge of that track, then the boom will be a bit further out, more this area. And if we pull that pulley up this end, then the boom would be more here. So that rope would stay the same angle and the whole thing, this pulley and that pulley would all move with this bottom pulley here. So that's another way of controlling the shape of the sail. So if we want to sail in a very kind of basic, simple way, we can just center the traveler as we've done here, and then just use the main sheet to let the sail in and out. If we want to get a little bit more technical, we can actually set the sail shape with the main sheet and then switch to using the traveler for positioning that boom in the correct position that we want it to be while we're looking at the telltales and how the air is flowing over it. Now I'm sure there'd be lots of puzzled looks on people's faces now. Um, when we do the sailing, you'll actually get a chance to pull on all of these bits of rope and see the effect that they have. And I think you'll get a lot more understanding then. So this here is um, Team Vestas, uh, Volvo Round the World Yacht Race Boat and they've got their traveller down, we would say. So it's downwind, wind's coming from across the boat. And they've also got a reef in, they haven't pulled all of their sail up. So it's obviously, you know, lots of water on the boat. So it's really strong conditions. They've made their sail as 
small as they can probably get it. And they've also dropped their traveller down. And if the traveller's down, that means I've got to pull harder on the main sheet to get the sail in the position they want. If it was light wind, well, they'd have the traveller up the other end. But like I say, this might come a lot clearer when we actually do some sailing. So heavy winds, we're going to have a really tight main sheet and we're going to release the traveller. Light winds, we're going to have a looser main sheet and we're going to pull on the traveller. And yeah, it helps with the stability of the boat as well. But bending that mast can help as well in terms of where the power is in relation to the keel, but that's getting really technical at that. Um, yeah, let's um, move on and we have a look at the um, chip. So we don't have all of those controls for the, the for the main cell. We we don't have all of those for the chip. Now it's somewhat simpler in that there's only one thing to adjust really. Um, all of those other controls, but let's just simplify those controls. So we've got the outhaul, the boom vang, the Cunningham, the backstay, all of that flattens the sail. If it's light wind, then we want them all loose and have lots of shape in the sail. If it's heavy winds, then we're going to pull them all on. If it's really heavy, then we're going to pull them all on a lot. Um, so we just want to flatten the sail as much as we can. And each one of those controls just flattens a different area of the sail. Um, and I think that's probably the simplest way I can make it in that, yeah. So don't worry too much about what it's called or what it actually does or the area. Just know at level one that if it's windy, we need to flatten the sail off and we're going to pull on all of those controls. When you've got a bit of experience, then you will be able to look at a sail and say, oh yeah, I think we need a bit more Cunningham or maybe we should ease the bang a little bit. Um, that will come with experience, but it's not really expected that everyone on a level one course would have that much knowledge. But as, I think as long as you know that we want to flat a sail when it's really windy, because we want a boat to do, that develops less power so we can control it, then you know we're just going to pull them all on or ease them all, depending on the wind conditions. And that's that's all we really need to know at level one. So these jib cars, um, in America or in Europe, they sometimes call them fair leads, but it's just a pulley. And in New Zealand, we call it a jib car because it's, well, it's part of the jib rigging. Um, and it, we call it a car because it moves. We can, we've got a track here and we can move that pulley forward and back on that track. So, and we're going to change the angle of the sheet. So this is our jib sheet, the rope that controls where this sail is. And the angle that that rope is at changes where the tension is on the sail. And we've got another slide that'll explain that a bit better. So here we've got a sail that's got the jib car in the middle of the track and that, that's the angle there for the rope and we've got kind of equal tension if you like down the lead channel on the foot of the sail. If we move the, the jib car forward then the angle steepens up and we're only really pulling on the leech of the sail and that gives us quite a full belly if you like. The sail's quite deep. That's a powerful sail. The picture at the bottom, um, we pulled the jib car back, which has again changed the angle, but now the force of that rope is pulling more on the foot of the sail, which means the sail's quite flat and the top of the sail is actually flapping and not doing anything, which is actually what we want. So if we want a full, really powerful sail, we'll have the jib car forward. That will give us lots of shape, lots of curve in the sail. And it'll make sure all of the sail is working because of that tension in the leech. 
if we want to reduce the power so it's a really windy day, we'll move the jib car back. We'll have a really flat sail. And because the leech of the sail isn't very tight, the top of the sail will actually be able to flap, which will depower the sail. So in effect, we'll only be using the bottom half of the sail to create lift. So this is a really powerful way of changing how much force we get from that sail. And it's a simple control. There's only two options really, forward or back. And you know, if we're overpowered, we pull it back. If we want to go faster, then we push it forward. Um, and if we think back to an earlier slide that had all the telltales on there, that had a group of telltales at the bottom, some in the middle and some at the top, and that would help us position that jib car. So if we want a really powerful sail like this one, all of those telltales in their three groups should be working. If we want to depower the sail and make it less efficient, well, we'll have a flat bit at the bottom of the sail and telltales will be working at the bottom. Maybe the telltales in the middle won't be working very well. They might be some of the time, but at the top of the sail, the telltales won't be working at all. And that's actually what we want in that situation to make the boat more manageable. They have uh, the right amount of power for those conditions. Yeah, so flatter sail, less powerful. A fuller sail, more powerful. So exactly the same as the other controls, really. That's all we're doing. We're, make, we're changing from a very powerful sail to a less powerful sail. Now, this can um, give a bit of an idea of twist. So either with the jib car on the, on the um, head sail or with the boom vang, we can induce twist. So we can have the bottom of the sail quite close to us and the top of the sail further away from us and have different amounts of power in different areas of the sail. And that might be because the wind is at a different direction at the top of the mast. Or it could be that we want the top of the sail to flap and not be efficient because we just want to use the bottom of the bit of the sail because we're struggling with how much power it's creating. Yeah. So all done by by easing the boom vang, or if we're using the traveler and the main sheet to control the shape, then we'll be having a bit looser main sheet and we'll, we'll probably be moving the um, traveler to position that boom where we want it to be. Yeah. So we can see the different curvature in the sail there. And there's another picture here on twist. Yeah. So we can see that if we've got lots of twist, the top of the sail is not really doing much. If we've got no twist, well, all of the sail is working, all of the sail is causing creating power which is exactly what we want in light conditions. We want to use all of the sail, but in heavier conditions, we might be spilling off some of that wind just to keep control of the boat. Okay. Yeah, interesting slide, this one. Yeah, if we pull on one rope, so we pull on the outhaul, then that is going to change the tension in the other areas of the sail a little bit. So we try and need to adjust them all to get the right balance between them all. And some more of Annalise's humour coming in. And uh, well, maybe give us a thumbs up if you're feeling fine or um, I don't know, how many people are um, feeling confused by what we've just gone through? Um, Normally, yeah, okay, Lara, somewhere in between, yep, yeah, from Haley. Um, yeah, it's like I say, with all of those controls, I think they'll make a lot more sense when we actually get out on the, on the boat and we'll actually 
see the things moving and be able to see the effect that it has. You might even be able to feel the effect on the tiller. Okay, then Michelle, that's cool. Thank you for letting me know that some of the stuff you've seen in the past is making a bit more sense now, that's cool. But yeah, so if you're feeling slightly confused about that, don't worry too much about it. If we flatten the sail and we use all of those controls to do that, things will be easier on the boat when we're sailing in higher wind. If we want to go faster, we need a bit more belly in the sail, we need a bit more shape, a bit more curve. If it's windy, we need a flatter sail. And yeah, we can use just the bottom half if we want with those controls. When we get out doing the um, actually actual sailing, I, I'm fairly sure it will make a lot more sense. Um, if we've been pulling on those controls though, and we still feel a bit overpowered, then we need to make the sail smaller. And this boat here, this is one of the MRXs that we use. Um, there's 11, we've got 11 of these boats which we run sailing courses on. Um, so we've got some of the sail hanging around by the boom and that's because we haven't pulled it all up. And that's the next thing to do. So we start off sailing, nice sunny day, and then the clouds come in and it gets darker. Well, we might need to make that sail smaller. And on most cruising boats, they would have three reefs. On, on our MRXs, I've only got the one reef and the guys that race them would never use it. Um, but we, we use it quite a lot. And it's nice just to keep the boat a bit calmer. Um, yeah, and that statement from Annalise that, you know, if you're thinking about putting in a reef, you probably should have already done it. You know, it's a bit like that um, uh, jibing. You know, if you're a little bit worried about jibing, it shouldn't be a discussion or a thought. Just do the granny tack and don't do the jibe. If you're thinking, hmm, we might be a bit overpowered, you, you know, don't ponder that for very long. You know, put the reef in, particularly if you feel that it could get worse, but much better to reef early. So here we go. Three reefing points. This would be a cruising boat. If you're on the third reef, um, looks like I need to change the, uh, make a change there, but um, I'm pleased I've had a study of this um, slide and found that. Um, I'll correct that then. Um, but yeah, so if you're on the third reef, then it, you, you know, you're in storm conditions and you'd be a bit nuts to choose to go sailing in there. But if you're out cruising and you find yourself in 35 knots, well, the third reef is there and you know, you'd be silly not to use it. So we might not have a choice about using these things. Um, this is going to, what the sail is going to look like. So it's not going to go all the way up to the top of the mast. We're going to lose our outhaul and our Cunningham. They're all going to be wrapped up in a bit of sail at the bottom. So this reefing line pulls the sail down and kind of replaces the um, outhaul. It pulls the sail out to the end of the boom. So if you've got <coughs> one of the old reefing systems that just used reefing lines and tied with a reef knot, then you could have quite a baggy sail, a sail that's got quite a lot of shape to it, which of course if you're trying to depower the boat is a bit stupid. You want to have a flat sail and a smaller sail if, if it's um, really windy. So how this is shown, the front edge of the sail goes on this reef hook. So you just lower the sail down, put whichever hole you want on that reef hook, and then your reefing line goes through the back of the sail and pulls the leech down. And on here, we've got some little ropes here that are um, tidying up the bottom of the sail and stopping it from flapping around. And we have, that's just a short length of rope tied together with a reef knot that we did last week. Importantly though, these ropes don't want to go around the boom, they just want to go around the sail. Because if you've got small little holes in the sail for the ropes to go through, then they're not necessarily 
strong enough to be tied hard to something. So the front edge and the back edge will be really strong. It'll be multiple layers of sailcloth, lots of stitching, lots of diagonal stitching. But there might be a few small holes in the middle of the sail and they probably won't be reinforced. And if we tie them to the boom, then maybe the sail will get ripped. So better not to tie the reefing lines around the boom, just around the sail. No reefing points on that boat. They, um, they have different size sails that they put on. Um, still got those um, telltale sails. So this is what I meant about adjusting those jib cars. We might have the bottom set working quite nicely. My mouse is stuck. So they're working nice, they're working well. A little bit different. So maybe they haven't got their jib car set in completely perfect spot. Or it might be that they're a little bit overpowered and they don't want the top of the sail to be, you know, creating too much lift because they're struggling to control the boat but um, we use each group of telltales just to check on the shape of the sail and like I say these stripes are so we can see the curve if we just look at the black part above Ineos can't really see any curve in there but you put a stripe on the sail and you can see the curve there's not much they've got a very flat sail but you can just see the curvature. So that's what those stripes on the sail is for, just to help us see how much curve we've got in the sail. Okay, so into knots. And this will be a welcome break for, for most of us, I think, having gone through that. Um, coiling a rope. Now, it's, can everyone see me? Um, my picture's coming up, is it? Maybe give me a thumbs up. Um, okay, so I've just got a question from Richard about the, yeah, so a few questions coming in, all right, we'll go over these. So first up from Richard, could you run through the van again? Does it flatten the sail? Um, yes, so, yeah, correct, Richard. You, you, it, it does flatten the sail. Um, and in, so with modern boats, with quite bendy masts, you're probably better off to have a very flat sail and then point up a little bit higher to control those wind gusts and stuff. Spilling wind off the top of the sail and easing the boom vane and letting the, letting the sail um, spill wind at the top is not really a modern way of sailing, um, but it is correct for a lot of modern cruising boats that don't have such a bendable mast. You know, they, they might have a forestay that goes right to the top and a backstay that's not adjustable. And in which case you might well want to, <clears throat> excuse me, spill some wind off the top of the sail and for that, you're gonna to have to ease the, the boom up. But in doing that, the power of the sail actually increases up to the point where it starts to flap and then it loses power. So I would prefer to keep that sail really tight and flat and then use the, use the tiller to control where I was going and actually make the sail flat with the tiller if I needed to. Um, and again, I think that might be better to demonstrate on the boat. Um, so can you reef a head sail, Hester asked. Um, you can. So a lot of modern cruising boats are coming out with um, reefing points in their head sail. A lot of racing boats like Team New Zealand and the America's Cup boats will have different size sails, normally three. So there'll be a small one, which would be a number three and then a medium sized one, number two, and then the number one head sail, that'd be the big one. So on a race boat or a more traditional cruising boat, you would pick the sail that you wanted to use for those conditions. So maybe, I don't know, from zero 
to 10 knots, you use the number one, the big one, and then maybe over, say, 12 knots, you go down to the number two. And then if you're sailing in plus 20 knots or plus 25 knots, maybe you're using the little one, the number three. Many cruising boats nowadays, though, have roller furling, so you can roll out as much of the sail as you want to. Um, there are some race boats now, though, that are that they do have a reefing system very much like the mainsail, where they just don't pull all of the sail up. Um, and it's partly to do with weight, really, with the furling systems. Um, that's it. But yeah, so everyone can see me. Can they? Is, is my photo coming through? Because I haven't got that up on the screen, on my screen anyway. So. Uh, it is yeah, good. We can see me. I'm glad I wasn't doing anything weird. Awesome. All right. Well, I'm going to grab my right then. Thank you for confirming that you could see me. I'm not quite sure why I can't see myself. Okay. So coiling a rope. Um, my rope's quite long. You might not be able to do this at home if your rope's quite short. Um, we will definitely get chance to do this in that practical sailing day because we'll need to do it when we pack the boat up. The reason why we want to coil the ropes up is simply because we want to leave the boat nice and neat and tidy. Um, the boats we use are used by a lot of different people and <clears throat> you know they get quite grumpy if the boat's not how it should be and certainly when I'm going sailing with a group of students they don't want to spend half an hour untangling a rope because that is half an hour I'm not teaching my students. So it's it's good practice to get into. Um, and if I hold the rope in one hand and I go, I pull it to the full extent of my hands, I don't know if I can get position where you can see both hands. Um, I'm moving enough, there we go. So if I go out to the full extent of my arms, when I bring my hands back together, we're going to have a coil that's that long. And if I do that again, well, my arms are still the same length. So that coil will be the same length. So that's how I get the coils to be the same length. And now we need to tidy that up. And I'll come a bit closer for that. So I'll just coil it up a bit so my rope's not quite long enough. So I'll do it a bit shorter. Okay, so there we go. I've got a coil of rope here. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to work out which way I need to move. All right, so I'm going to take the end of the rope and I'm just going to wrap it around. That will hold my coils together. And then if I take a little bit of a loop, just in the tail and poke that through the top there. I can take the other end of the tail and poke it through the loop I've just created. And that will mean that that will hold my coil together. I might do that again a little nicer and a bit neater. So there we go, there's my coils. I'm going to wrap it around. I'm going to go around a few times this time. There we go. So all of those wraps will keep the coil together. Then I'm going to make a loop. And I'm going to poke that through the top. And I'm going to take the tail and just poke it through the loop I've created. And when I drop that down, that will just keep it all tidy. So let's say we'll definitely get a chance to practice this on the boat. Um, there is another thing that you can do. So I quite like doing it that way because it doesn't take long to um, untie. Some people will, that loop that you pass through, they will take that over the top and bring it down because that will kind of lock it off. But I find that quite hard to undo if I'm in a hurry. So I much prefer just to poke the tail through the end. And it does give you a bit to sort of tie on and up somewhere. So 
We've got another question come through, I think. How do you stop it twisting? Yeah, good question. So quite often the twist is in the road um, because we've been using it. And as I go and form my um, coils, I might just roll the rope in my fingers. So I don't know if I can position the camera so it does it. I can kind of twist my fingers and you know, move the rope. So that's how I do it. Um, so here I've got one that's not quite, oh, it's not too bad. Yeah, so as I'm bringing my hands together, I'll just roll my fingers to make take that twist out. Um, it's probably easier to show you how to do that on the boat with a different uh, rope, and particularly one that's been used, because there, were, there is often um, twists in the rope. And um, yeah, depending on which end you start. So you want to start on the on the bit and work. So like if you're going through a pulley, if you take the rope from the pulley and then start coiling, all the twisted bit ends up going off the end of the line. But if you start at the free end of the rope and work towards the pulley, well, the twisted bit is just going to the pulley and then it, it can't go anywhere. So start at the pulley and then start making your coils up and you'll find all the twisted bit disappears off the end of the tail. Um, okay, so let's, we do have a, another video on that, which will have um, much better camera angles than what you've just experienced. So have, have a look at that as well. Um, right, so clove pitch. I really quite like this knot because it's quite simple. And I've, I've brought in a device specifically to help me. It's a um, kitchen rock holder, kitchen paper, paper towel holder. Um, if I can get that in shot. There we go. All right, so with this, we're going to be tying it onto something. We go across. And as we go around what we're tying it around, if we go sort of a, so it crosses over, when we come back around, we can just poke the tail underneath the bit that's crossed over the first round. So that's how it looks. Oh, it's really untidy. I think my knot demonstrations have got worse as time's gone on, not better. Anyway, so that's how the knot looks, just like the picture. Let's go over that again. So, the problem is I don't have enough hands. So we've just got the rope going over. When we come up the other side, we're gonna cross over. We're gonna keep going round in the same direction we started going round in. And as we come up, we're just gonna poke it under the bit that crosses over the first path and then we pull it tight and as we pull it tight the bit that goes across diagonally kind of goes down on those two bits and stops it from coming undone. It will shake loose after a while. Um, I quite like using this for tying fenders on um, and the reason I like that is because I can slide the rope along I can loosen it easily and make it longer or shorter and I can tighten it up again. So it's a quick knot, little knot to tie for tying fenders on. So if you're coming into the dock and you want to tie the fenders on really quick, I quite like this. I wouldn't leave the fenders on like that for the next month though. So that's just a really quick way of tying the fenders on moments before I'm going into the dock. If I want to leave it more permanently, then I'm going to actually tie some half hitches underneath there, which is a kind of, I would do two half hitches. So it then kind of turns it into a round turn and two half hitches, which is a more permanent way of holding the fenders on. But it does, it is quite a nice quick way of doing it. Anyway, 
Um, yeah, so I do that slightly different camera angle maybe. So we're going around. And we're going to cross over, keep going round, and then we're going to poke it under the bit that goes across the diagonal bit. And then we're just going to pull it tight. And if I've tied it correctly, um, yeah, looks okay. We've got this bit going across, which holds these two down. And it's just a friction that's in there that holds it. Okay, well, let's move on. Like I say, I think with the small screen that, with the, well, that you've got me on, the reason why I haven't um, stopped sharing my screen and gone so my picture is big for you guys is that I'm quite fearful that I won't be able to start sharing the screen again. I might have some technical problem, but I, I am reassured that we do have some really good um, videos on YouTube that will help you. Uh, and, you know, they were done in multiple takes and with different camera angles. So um, that would be a really good source to, um, to have a look at. Um, if there's anybody struggling with knots, then um, we can, um, you know, go over some knots while we're rigging up uh, as well. Uh, Okay, and, and Bradley seems to think he's got um, a way of changing the screen anyway, so you're just looking at me. Awesome. I know um, Sim, the uh, uh, co-host, she, she did put a message out on the level two, oh, sorry, the lesson two, helping people with that. All right, let's move on. So it's American Magic going past Bean Rock. Um, so the person overboard. I'll start being more PC if the rest of the sailing world doesn't want to. Um, really dangerous kind of situation, um, particularly if you don't have a life jacket. That gentleman there has got a nice life jacket on. It looks like he's got quite a bit of equipment on that life jacket, which should keep him nice and safe and above the water, ready for, for recovery. Um, and we will teach you this manoeuvre on that um, uh, sailing day. Uh, using video of someone getting wet. So that's what we call a crash jibe. No one was expecting that. And if you notice, while everyone's really concerned about the person that's in the water, nobody on the boat has noticed that the head sail has filled on the other side of the boat. And well, that's telling me is that they're about to crash jive again and that boom is going to come whizzing across and they're all looking at the guy in the water. So we can watch that again if you like. So head sail starts to come through. The lady holding the boom doesn't stop it. Head sail fills on this side. Yeah, and that boom is about to come back again. So these two gentlemen about to have a headache. Um, so that's the danger of doing a crash jibe. Um, and yeah, we don't really want people in the water. So the, the lady that was holding the boom over quite often in light winds to stop the, the boom from bouncing around when we go over waves, we might hold the boom over, but that does kind of require the, the person steering the boat to um, keep the boat going in a straight line relative to the wind. Um, this is a, someone, a celebrity, jumping off the back of Don Fong as they left Auckland. So this is um, uh, Glenn Dowie in the background there. And so on the inshore race, we had celebrities on the boat. And so they did the inshore race and the finish of the inshore race was the start of the, um, that leg to Brazil and the celebrities that to jump off um, and they had boats picking them up. So number one rule when we have someone over the side of the boat is to stay calm and keep everyone safe. You know, we don't want to be 
accidentally jiving again and causing another accident or another person over the side. And it's hard to stay calm. Uh, um, I've done, you know, we practice man overboard drill all the time. So, you, you know, we do it, you know, 10 times on a level one course. We do it, I don't know, another 20 times on a level two cruising course because we kind of need people to be a little bit better at it. Um, so for level one, we're, we're just really trying to teach the concept. And, you know, if you can get fairly close to the life jacket we'll throw in the water, then that, that's cool. Um, if we have to go around again, that's fine. Once we get to level two, we kind of expect everyone to be able to do it quite well. And on the level three cruising course, we'll do a man overboard drill at night. So you can see the difference that um, not being able to see your target makes. Um, but staying calm is something I don't know that I could do. You know, if, if someone that I cared about was in the water, you know, maybe a child or partner, or even someone that I sailed with regularly and who was a really good friend. In that situation, you know, they're gonna die if you don't go and pick them up. I don't know that I would be really calm during that situation, but staying calm is gonna make things work a lot better. And you, you've gotta be, yeah, calm, professional, and make things a bit easier on yourself as well. You know, don't, don't start trying to do really difficult maneuvers. So the, um, what we normally do would be to, certainly in a cruising situation, would be to just throw trash over the side. So seat cushions, um, cans of diesel, diesel's lighter than water, so it will float, even a full can, anything that floats. If you throw it in the water, then you create a bit of a debris field and having multiple targets to spot will increase your chances of finding the person that's in the water. So we're gonna point, we're gonna shout, we're gonna throw. We definitely don't want to keep the man overboard a secret. We're gonna point. So one person on the boat is not gonna sail anymore. They're just gonna to point to the person all the time. And as we move and do the turn, they're just gonna keep pointing at them. Um, it's really important that they don't take any part in the sailing of the boat because if they take their eyes off them and the boat turns, then when they look again, they begin looking at a different patch of sea. And you might not be able to see the person all the time. You know, they might just see them when they're on top of a wave. And when they're at the bottom of a wave, maybe you can't see them. So, you know, if one person needs to be assigned a job of a spotter, then that's all they do. Um, this makes some grim reading. I hope I'm not putting people off sailing. Um, luckily in um, Auckland, we don't need to worry too much about water temperatures because, you know, the water's quite warm even in the middle of the winter. Uh, if you're on the South Island, well, yeah, there's probably some urgency in doing this pickup because the water temperature will affect the survival rate quite a lot. Um, the good news here is though, that I'm going to teach you a way of picking somebody up within two or three minutes. So, you know, they're barely going to be wet by the time you get them back on board. Um, yeah, really good idea to prevent the man overboard. So hanging on to something, really good communication, not turning the boat when um, people aren't expecting it, you know, making you know, reefing the sail. We can see that this boat here has got a reef sail, obviously quite, quite tough conditions. They've got a reef sail, so they're making things as easy as they can on board the boat, as calm as possible, even though there's a lot of wind and there's a lot of power in those sails. But, you know, still sometimes people end up in the water and we're gonna have a look at how we get them. Yeah, all right. So yeah, there are a few things we need to consider. So a racing sailing boat's gonna handle quite a bit different to a cruising boat. Whether we've got roller furling or not, you know, we can roll up those sails really quickly, might change 
our um, procedures a little bit. It was going to take us a long time to pack the sails away. Well, they're going to stay up. Um, the size and weight of an individual. So, you know, I'm over 100 kilos. And if I'm in the water in wet clothing, then I'm probably 120 kilos. How would you get me back on the boat? Um, yeah. So we'll have a little think about that. Whether the person in the water is conscious or not, that's going to make a big difference. And limitations. So we've got the weather, visibility, sea state, currents, all of those things we need to consider. If we have a look at this guy here, he's very, being very helpful in extending his arm to the guy in the water. But if we consider that picture for a little while, where do you think the wind direction is? We can see on this boat here, the sails are all eased out. This boat here has got a Jenica on, so that's a downwind sail. So all of those boats are on a broad reach at the very least. So basically going downwind. And those boats are not going to stop when they're going downwind. So this guy in the water, there's got no chance of getting hold of him. You know, that boat is doing... I don't know, eight knots downwind, and that person in the water can swim. I don't know if he can swim really fast, he might be able to do one knot. So this gap is getting bigger, and that arm is not long enough. We can only pick someone up if we're heading upwind. So let's figure out how we're going to do, get the boat in that position so we're heading upwind to pick someone up. So here we go. So we've got two boats there. That's kind of like the ideal position, if you like. Um, this boat here, we've got the wind coming on the side of the boat. We've got the sail flapping, so it'd be stationary. And the wind is going to blow the boat downwind onto the person in the water. This boat here, same position, but the boat's being blown away from the person in the water. So ideally, we want to be in this position where the boat's going to get blown onto the person and then the boat and the person move us one thing and that's going to give you time to get a rope to them. But we need to be able to turn the boat so we're in that position. So let's have a look at that. So we're not going to jibe. The reason we're not going to jibe is that it's a more difficult manoeuvre, it's more risky the chance of hitting a person that's our spotter on the head with the boom is really high. You know, that person has been told to not take their eyes off the person in the water. So they're pointing and I'm watching them constantly. They're not paying any attention to what's happening on the boat. And if we jibe, they certainly are likely to get hit with the boom. And then we've got someone that's unconscious or someone that's in the water or both. So that, Jiving often leads to a bad outcome. Dropping the sails. Now, if you're on a cruising boat and it takes minutes to roll the sails up, then that might well be a good thing to do. On a lot of boats we sail on, um, it takes some time to fold the sails up. And I think that's wasted time. We need to be straight into picking the person up. So these two methods that we're going to go through are ways of picking somebody up under sail. And we're going to do it under sail because it's going to take two or three minutes. And that's a lot quicker than packing the sails away. The other thing with dropping the sails is, so, okay, you know, you talk to me and you say, well, why the hell are we going to pack the sails away nice and lengthy? Well, yeah, we're probably not. We're just going to dump the sails on the deck, turn the motor on. And if we're not really tidy on a boat, if we've got ropes over the side, they'll get wrapped around the motor, around the propeller, and the propeller won't chop the rope up. It's, it, it's quite amazing stuff, the rope. It just wraps around the propeller and stops the motor. And then your boat's disabled, and you're not going to be able to start the motor again until someone has swam under the boat and cut that rope off and cleared the propeller. And at that point, you might well have drifted quite a long way away from the person that's in the water. And you, you've actually got two people in the water anyway. So th that's definitely worse than the situation that you had to start with. Um, yeah, two, three minutes, you should be able to do it under sail. 
Right, let's get into that. Oh, a little tip. This is my little tip, not Anna Lisa's one. But yeah, if we go and pick up our hats, we get to practice this manoeuvre at random times. And, you know, everyone on, on the boat is quite well trained then if we pick up everybody's hat. Okay, so the standard go-to manoeuvre is called the figure of eight um, man overboard drill. And this is what we got. So we've got the red face or the orange face is the person in the water. The boat's close hauled, sailing upwind. But we don't need to sail upwind anymore. So the first manoeuvre we're going to do is to bear away onto a reach. And we're going to sail away from them. That sounds a little crazy, but we just want to make a little bit of space so we can do the next manoeuvre, which is a granny tack. So we reach away from them. We do the tack, bear away, come down. And once we get downwind of the person, then we can start turning up wind. Now, even if you're on a boat that's got nice furling head sails and stuff, I would suggest that the reach and the tack, and when we're going downwind, that would be the opportunity to roll the sail up, the head sail, or start the motor. Because nothing's really happening, we're just waiting to get downwind before we start turning upwind. And then we're going to turn up and we're going to sail up to them, that person. And hopefully we're going to stop like that. Now you'll notice that on this picture, boat six is actually in the wrong place. It's getting blown away from the person. I actually teach it like this on the practical course because we're often using a boy, um, you know, one of our racing boys. And I don't, I, I actually want to get blown off it. I don't want to get tangled up on it. Um, if we're using a life jacket, then I do get the students to park the boat on the windward side of the person or the life jacket that's in the water. So this is drawn deliberately incorrect, if you like, because that's actually the maneuver we're going to do. And I do tend to explain that to the people that are on that course that we really want to be the other side. But today we're going to do it like this. Um, like I said, uh, if we, the, the racing boys or the, um, any of the marks that are out in the water, you know, they're, they've got massive concrete weights on the bottom of them and big thick chains. And I don't want to wrap that around the keel, which is why we do it like this. But yeah, it's, it's not really correct. We want to be on the other side. Okay, so sailing upwind, man overboard, someone's pointing, we're throwing stuff out the back of the boat as we're turning onto a reach. We reach away. When we get two or three boat lengths away from them, or maybe three or four boat lengths, we can do the turn. It does depend on how quickly your boat turns. I don't want to sail away from them too far because the further we get away from them, the harder they are to spot. So I'm only going to sail away enough to do that turn. I think in the Yachting New Zealand book, it says five to eight boat lengths. And I think that's nuts. That, that's just way too far. So we can sail away a little bit. When we get far enough away to do this big tack, this granny tack, we're going to sail downwind. We'll drop the head sail or roll it up if we can. And then when we're downwind of them, we're going to sail upwind. And if we've got the motor on at this point, that might be able to help us but we'll be doing it under sail. Okay. So this is quite an interesting picture. We borrowed this from, from Rick, our American coach. So we've got that boat at the top of the screen that's running, sailing straight downwind to the black dot, which is the person we want to pick up. And they're upwind. They're windward of the person in the water because they're sailing downwind. Now they can go straight to the person but they can't stop when they get there. Those sails don't magically disappear. Even if they didn't have the sails up, they would still move downwind just by the windage of the boat. The wind blowing on the side of the boat is going to make it go downwind. So downwind, we can't do the pickup. We can get there, but we can't stop. If we try and go 
head to wind, well, if our sails are flapping, we're not moving forward, this boat is actually going backwards slowly, and it's definitely not going to get there. If we had started the motor, we might be able to drive up, but under sail, without the motor, that boat's not going to reach to the person. So this boat here on a broad reach, on a, on a beam reach more, sorry, that boat will get to that black dot really quickly, but it's going to have a lot of speed and it might not be able to ease the sails enough to get rid of that speed. So that's going to struggle to stop. Um, yeah, so it can get there, but can't stop. Can get there again, but probably can't stop. Is stopped and can't get there. These boats here, well, they're in the Goldilocks zone. So this is like between a close reach and close hauled. They can get there and they only need to ease the sails out a little bit and they'll slow down and stop. They'll, they're just on the edge of the no-go zone or maybe a little bit lower than that. So they've got a bit of, they've got a bit more up to go if they want, or they can come down a little bit, but they can definitely ease their sails and make them flap and make them get the boat to stop. So this boat here, if we do find ourselves reaching in, well, what can we do? Well, we can just bear away, get into that Goldilocks zone, and then start sailing on a close reach to them. If we're this boat, you know, we're in that no-go zone, we can't quite get there. If our motor's on, then we can just force the boat upwind, even though our sails are flapping. But if we're doing it without the motor, um, if we bear away again, do a tack when we get into that Goldilocks zone, then we can sail up there again. So interesting little slide of different angles that we could approach at. The ones in the green are what we're aiming for. That's what we want to be. We want to be sailing upwind so that we can stop when we get there. We don't really want to be coming in really fast on a reach. And if we're in that no-go zone, we're not going to be able to stop. Oh, sorry, we're not going to be able to get there. We're going to need the engine on to get there. Okay, so this is a, um, a different way of doing things. So this is called the heave two method. Oh, actually, I might just go back a few slides before I get into that. Let's go back to that figure of eight. Yeah, there we go. So on this figure of eight, this is the complete picture, if you like. So if we're going upwind, we're going to bear away first. But if we're already on a reach, we just carry on reaching, give us a bit, give us a big gap and then do the granny tack. If we're sailing downwind when we get the man overboard, well, we just need to keep sailing downwind and then turn around and zigzag our way back up. So upwind is like the starting position. And if you're on a different point of sail when the man overboard happens, it just means you're further around that figure of eight. But it's the same procedure you're just in a different position on that procedure i'll just get forward again and now look at this heave two method i really like the heave two method and um so we've got someone in the water um we're sailing upwind we do a tack straight away and we'll notice that we haven't eased the sail that that sail is on the wrong side of the boat. So on boat one, we've got both sails on the left-hand side of the boat. And if we leave that jib sheet, the rope that controls that head sail, if we leave it tied off or on the winch and don't ease it through the, through the tack, the boom's going to swap sides with the main sail. But that sail is still tied to the left-hand side of the boat. The wind's coming, so it will blow it the other way, but it can't 
come all the way over to the other side of the boat. Now this is the heave to, and that's kind of like slamming the handbrake on on a car. It, it stops it quite quick. We're not gonna slowly roll forward with our momentum. The, the, the heave to with having one sail forcefully held on the wrong side of the boat will stop the boat very quickly. And in effect, the head sail wants to make the boat go backwards and the main sail wants to make the boat go forwards and there's a bit of a stalemate happening. So at that point, we just need to point the tiller towards the boom. So if we're pointing the tiller at the boom, wherever the boom goes, we just point the tiller towards it. That will keep the bow of the boat facing into wind. And at that point, everything's quiet and calm. And this is the only method I think that I could do in a very quiet, calm way. And it's because there's not a lot of noise on the boat. Whenever there's, the sails are flapping, um, the, the boat's noisy. You know, you can hear the sailcloth rattling and there's ropes flapping around all over the place. So there's a lot of energy, if you like. Here, there's still quite a lot of energy, but you, you don't hear it. So the sails are full, they're powered up, but the boat's stationary and, and everything's quiet. So there's kind of, a, like I say, a stalemate happening. At that point, you can start the engine and we're just gonna use the engine to keep us between the wind and the person that's in the water. And we're just gonna allow the wind to blow the boat downwind onto the person that's in the water. So that's what, this is what that's gonna look like. So if we get blown, so we're a bit too far back, we drive forwards. If we're too far forwards, we drive back. And the idea is we keep the boat between the wind and the person and we end up right beside the person in exactly the right place to be. And I think this will show us again. So we're getting too far back, drive forward, too far forward, drive back. So it's a bit of forward and reverse, but importantly, we're not trying to reverse to the person that's in the water. We're just trying to hold our position so as the wind comes down the top of the page, the boat stays in between the person and the wind and the wind will do the rest. It will blow us sideways quite quickly. And once we're here, the boat's still calm and stationary. You know, it is moving with the wind and the tide, but with the person as well. We don't have to, there's not much sailing to do with this. With the other figure of eight, there's quite a lot of sailing, you know, we've got to reach, we've got to do this big tack, sail downwind, then think about the angles and come up on the right one. With this method, we just tack, the boat stops and we drift down onto the person and the engine is there just to help us hold that position between the wind and the person that's in the water. Now, if you're going to be sailing as part of a, a team, you know, there's four or five of you on the boat, that figure of eight works quite well because, you know, so say there's six of you on the boat, one person's in the water, so there's five of you, but you've lost two people really because one person's not sailing the boat, they're just spotting. So you're down to four crew. So if you needed six to jibe the boat safely, and now you've only got four, so we're definitely not gonna jibe, we're gonna keep things really simple. We're gonna do the tech because that's really easy. And it's easy to do with less people on the boat, with less people pulling on ropes and doing all the sailing. Then we've got to do the tack, come down wind and pick them up. So that works quite well if there's lots of people on the boat. Now, if I'm sailing for my own pleasure, it would likely to be just me and a significant other. And you know, if I'm in the water, then the person that's on the boat is gonna to have to do everything on their own. Now, you know, I could probably do the figure of eight by myself, uh, depending on how the boat's set up. Um, but it, this method, the heave two method, is far simpler. You just tack, in fact, you don't have to do anything apart from move the tiller. So there's no ropes to pull or anything. The boom will tack itself. 
the head sail we're not going to touch. We want it to be on the wrong side of the boat. So we just move the tiller and tack and the boat stops. We can tie the tiller over so the boat stays into wind while we can start the, the uh, motor or get ropes or boat hooks or whatever we need. And while we're doing that, the boat is getting closer to the person that's in the water. So if you're planning on sailing as a couple, this is the method that I would suggest you do. And it's, it's really quite simple. Um, if you're on a race boat that has a very bendy mast, like those MRX boats, I find that taking the um, backstay off makes it a much more stable in that heave to position. Most cruising boats that are set up for cruising are very well balanced. So they'll heave to really easily. The head sail is kind of as powerful as the main sail. But on race boats, they're kind of made a little bit unstable, if you like, because we want them to be very maneuverable. And that can mean that holding a race boat in the heave to position is, you know, they don't want to do that. They want to be sailing all the time. Um, and easing the back stay will make that a bit easier. Um, but yeah, cruising boats, really easy to make this heave to happen. Um, and yeah, there's very little drama on the boat. There's, there's, there's hardly any sailing to do. It's calm, it's quiet. And yeah, it's pretty straightforward. If it doesn't work, well, we're going to take the handbrake off. So we're going to ease the rope that's controlling that head sail. The head sail is going to flip to the other side. And then we're going to start sailing. And we're straight into that figure of eight and we're coming back. Um, both the figure of eight and the heave two method should only take two or three minutes to do, which I think is, is quicker than most people are going to pack the boat away and make sure those ropes are tidy. Um, all the ropes in the heave two are being used. You know, the halyards are pulling the sails up, the sheets are tight because the sails are, are sheeted on. So there's nothing to end up in the water and wrapped around the propeller. It's quite a nice, simple, safe way of doing it. Um, the only thing is, it only really works if the person falls off the boat when you're sailing upwind. So it might well be that if you're sailing downwind, then you do need to tack and sail back up to them. But finishing the maneuver off with a heave two is likely to make the pickup a lot easier because you don't have to worry about the boat. You can like say simply you can tie the tiller over, the boat will stay head to wind in that position and you can work to get this person back on board. Let's have to think about how we're going to get that person on board. And yeah, so like I say we're probably picking up someone that's I don't know, maybe a metre below our feet. But we've got to lift them a metre to get them on the boat. And, you know, people are going to be a lot heavier when they're wet and when all their clothing is wet. So what equipment do we have on the boat that could help us? Um, so there's quite a bit, actually. So quite often boats are actually made so it's quite easy to get on and off. They have a swimming platform or boarding ladder on the back of the boat. So if the person's conscious, then you can just throw a rope to them, drag them round to the back of the boat and then help them climb the, the boarding ladder. So you could also use a rope or a halyard and put the rope on the winch. So if you tied a bowline on a long length of rope and threw that to them, they could put that over their shoulders and you can put the other end of that uh, other end of that rope on a winch and winch them back on board. If you're going to do that it might be a bit nicer to use a halyard because that would come off the top of the mast so you wouldn't be pulling them onto the side of the boat quite so hard. And this thing here is quite important so if someone's unconscious and you need to get in the water to get to them well as soon as someone goes in the water, you've got another man overboard. 
So make sure there's a rope tied to that person so you can, well, you know, if you're sailing as a couple, you know, the rope tied onto the boat, you tie the other end onto you, you go and swim after your partner, you get them, and then you can use the rope to pull yourself back onto the boat. So even if boats are seemingly stationary in this heave two position, or maybe even you've dropped the sails and there's no sails up, boats can move faster than we can swim, even if there's nothing seemingly powering them. You know, the wind and the tide will make the boat move quite fast. And certainly if you're swimming after it, you'll appreciate how, how quick the tide is sometimes. So if you're tied on, then, you know, if, if, you, if you get to the person that's in the water, great, you can grab them and then you can pull yourself back on board the boat. If you don't get to them, well, you can get yourself back to the boat and then get the boat closer to the person that's in the water and have another go. But you don't want to be swimming um, and not tied onto the boat because you, you might find yourself becoming a victim to a man overboard as well. Okay, well, that seems a bit grim to finish on that note, but um, the, both of these methods of getting someone back on board are, are fairly straightforward once you've gone over them a few times. It's definitely worth practicing and getting as good at them as you can. And like I say, when your hat blows off, you know, if we go and pick our hats up, well, there's a bit less rubbish in the sea and we spend less money on hats and we get to practice the man overboard drill. And hats are a really good thing to try and pick up because they will sink after a while. So if you take, if your hat disappears, it's probably sunk and you took too long. So when you get, so you can pick up a hat, then you can be fairly confident that you can um, pick somebody up that's fallen off your boat. And uh, that is the end. Um, I might go back to our socially distancing seagulls because I think that's quite a nice, cool picture. But um, so maybe I'll stop sharing this and I'll go full screen maybe. So um, yeah, thanks very much for for doing these um, uh, Zoom lessons. Um, it's been an interesting project for me. I've had to make a few changes to the um, PowerPoint presentation and I've um, learned a lot in, in terms of all the uh, technology that I've had to use. I've got uh, a laptop with two screens. I, I had an iPad earlier with a chat um, and I've got my phone doing the actual call. Um, I did that because I found that if I was using my laptop, if I was on the Zoom call, my um, PowerPoint presentation would run and that made some um, for cl some clunky changeover. So I've got multiple devices that's all being used. Um, but yeah, it's been really good. Now, um, somebody, I think it maybe was um, Hester that asked if I would consider doing the practical part on a catamaran. Now, we, um, we, we, we do have a catamaran that we charter for our level two courses. So if there was a group of people that wanted to do it on a catamaran, then we, we possibly could, um, but, but we would have to charter that boat. So um, that might be um, more expensive than doing it on the monohull that we had planned to do, but we could certainly plan to do that uh, if there was a group wanted to. Um, but I am also available for private coaching as well. So the Yacht Squadron does allow me to do one-on-one um, -on -one coaching with people. Um, I, you know, we put all of that through the Yacht Squadron, of course. Um, I'm not able to do that outside of the Yacht Squadron. Um, but yeah, so quite often, you know, if, if people buy boats, then I can go and do a delivery with them and, and maybe we'll do a, like a level two course while we're doing the delivery um, but also you know if you just want to go away and you just bought a boat and you're not quite sure how it works then either myself or another experienced coach can come along with you and and you know get you started in sailing that boat so 
we can do private coaching on your boat um, with you and a select group of your friends. And, you know, we can do that for a few days, a few hours, whatever you want, really. Um, yeah, does, does anybody have any questions? I see there's a bit coming through. Um, what's the minimum age for the course? Well, the youngest person we've had on the course was five. Um, that wasn't really intentional. So it's a nice Chinese family and their babysitter didn't turn up. So they arrived with their five-year-old daughter. And um, yeah, I rather than leaving her in the club on her own, I thought she could come out sailing with us. And, and she sailed a boat really well at the end of the course. Um, the oldest person we've had on the course has been about 75. Um, so while it's not, it's not really designed for children, um, you know, I don't really have a, a lower limit. Um, normally kids start to learn at about eight uh, if they're not scared of the water. So if you go to the beach and the kids are running into the surf and splashing and playing around, then it's about the right time for them to learn to sail if they want to. But if they're quite timid and scared of the water, then, you know, it might be a bit of a challenge to get them to focus when they're on the boat. Um, what else we got? So, so with a cruising boat, would there be no need for a Cunningham and a Traveller? Um, a lot of cruising boats do have Travellers, although they're not as effective as on a race boat where the Traveller goes the full width of the boat. Um, but there would normally be a, a Cunningham. Um, some boats that are more simply rigged might just be allowing for, you know, that mainsail to not be as long as the mast. And then, you know, you can still have the same effect as the Cunningham by pulling the sail up the mast a bit more with the um, halyard. Um, so it depends how the boat's set up. Um, so, yeah. Uh, lots of people saying thank you. Um, it's uh, yeah, it's been really cool to be able to share this all with you. Um, I'm really pleased to see everyone that's enjoyed it. Um, uh, yeah, and that was um, Sarah. Sorry, not Hester. That was looking at uh, buying the catamaran. I think. Sorry, I've had quite a lot of um, emails. Um, yeah, so Hester's asked the question, do we supply life jackets? Um, yeah, we definitely do. Um, so all of the boats have life jackets for everybody on board. And we certainly have a few spares as well. So yeah, no problem with life jackets, we'll supply them. Um, yeah, I think. Yeah, okay, so I think I've got all the questions. Um, is there any more? Um, looks like everyone's Everyone's quite happy. So, all right, so what happens next? Well, um, it'd be really good to see you on the practical course. If you don't want to do that, if you've got another sailing club, you're going to do the practical course with that. That's, that's cool. Um, no, no problem here with me. Uh, if you want, do want to get on to and do the sailing practical part with us, then you, know, you can go online and uh, book that now. I'm not quite sure of the dates yet, but I will update you as soon as I can. Um, at the end of all of our courses, I send, send out a um, you know, questionnaire, sort of typical kind of how do we do type thing. Um, I'd be really interested to get some really good feedback about how this came over. Because I mean, it was like say a very new thing for me. I wasn't sure how it was all gonna work out. Um, I've given a lot of comments saying thanks very much and that I've done quite well. I really appreciate that. The, the questionnaire I'll send you is only like, I don't know, three or four questions. It, it takes, I don't know, two minutes at most to fill out, but it'd be really cool to get some feedback. Um, there's a text box there as well, which you can free type some stuff in there as well as you, if you want to give us some tips as how we can do better. I'm certainly keen to try and find out where we're weak and where we're strong so we can be better. And feedback is, is the only way we're gonna be better, I think. Um, yeah, so thank you very much, everyone. I've really enjoyed it. It's given me something to do during lockdown. Um, and yeah, thank you very much for coming. So I will hopefully look forward to seeing you out in the water somewhere, either on our course or in a bay sipping champagne sometime.
All right. Take care, everyone. See you.